Monday, February 6th, 2023, here in our apartment in Yeoju, South Korea, we are within range of artillery from the North Korean border, and we think about this occasionally, but after a few months, a few days, a few years of living here, you kind of have to tune it out, and I think most of the country does, too. And uh, what do you, do you think about this? <laughs> I try not to think about it. I mean, yeah, we're like 30 miles. I don't I mean, Seoul is like 30 miles from the border with North Korea. Like, that's super freaky. And we're not much farther than that. That's one thing that a lot of Westerners don't think about or know about very much is that a lot of North Korea's military is... Uh, staged along the border, like ready to pounce. And they have a lot of long-range artillery mounted in the Kaesong Heights, which is a small mountain range kind of plateau area about 30 miles from Seoul. So if they were to push a button, they could demolish like a quarter of the city within a day, I think is the last... uh, it's freaky. The last estimate I saw. Yeah. But, um, you yeah. know, I used to think when we lived in Yeoju, I, or no, when we lived in on Jeju Island, I used to think about this sometimes, and I'd be like, well, at least on Jeju, we're a little farther, and maybe, like, our co-teacher, her husband was a fisherman, so in the back of my head, I was like, okay, if we ever had to escape, we'll just, like, go with her fisherman husband, and we'll, like, get out of here. Because, I mean, we're sitting ducks. What would you do mm-hmm. if, if they just invaded all of the sudden? Just like, yeah, we're sitting ducks. It's pretty freaky. Yeah. Occasionally we'll have a kind of a scare when a bunch of, uh, one time when we were in Daegu, there was someone shaking a bunch of hard plastic, like I think some construction material across the street. And it sounded like thunder, and it just kept going and going and going. Well, kind of like bombs. Like like bombs. Like, like it was bombs. very abrupt. And it was in the middle of the night, and for whatever reason, there were also uh, spotlights going on around the city at the same time. So Which I, had never happened before. Yeah. So. so we went up to the roof and looked, and I was just like, what? Huh? This is very, very strange. I mean, I suppose... If some provocations got out of control and and things just escalated really quickly, a war could break out. But uh, from what I understand, there would be um, what the North is more interested in doing are little provocations like bombing islands and kind of nibbling around the edges to prove a point. And uh, so I was like really doubtful. But when the explosion sounds just kept happening and the spotlights kept going over the sky eventually i was like oh this is kind of could be serious but eventually it stopped and i looked on the internet nothing i mean there's a pretty good amber alert style emergency system for all of our phones so if something happened i'm sure that they would try to alert everyone, tell us to get to shelters and stuff. And there are shelters all over the place. The subways have gas masks available for people, which you can see in Seoul. And then we had another scare last night, which was just a bunch of fireworks that you couldn't see because they were hidden behind a bunch of buildings. And it was and it went on for a while. And I was like, what? Huh? Bombs? What, what is this? Is this another thing? And I was just... I don't know. It sounds silly, but you never. It sounds silly, but when you're living here, though, like it's like I don't know. It's like kind of deep in your subconscious of like you don't want to think about it, but when you hear big bomb sounds or lightning or thunder, yeah. it kind of it comes forward. You're like, oh, are we safe? Yeah. yeah. And I'll say when we first moved to Yoju. Um, Pretty much, I think it was like the second or third day here. I have no idea why this was, but they were sending jets 
literally right over our apartment building. These are like military jets and they were super loud and they would fly multiple times throughout the day. And then on top of that, there were tanks being sent through the streets. And so when we got here, I was like, what is going on? I was asking our boss and she's like, okay, well, we've we've never seen these jets before. And I don't know about these tanks. So she didn't seem concerned, but I was very concerned. Yeah, they would shake the entire apartment. You couldn't hear anything. You went on so for about long. a week. And, oh, yeah. Longer. I mean, it was the worst for a week. And then it it continued for about a month and then petered out. But it was just nonstop, like bombers and cargo planes. Oh, yeah, and and huge, tanks. like army planes. And that's since stopped. Like it was that month and then it's like it hasn't happened since. Yeah. So we just assume maybe they're moving stuff from one military base to another. Yeah, it was a little unnerving to walk home and there's guys like, hiding behind sandbags next to a restaurant, wearing military uniforms with guns kind of looking at you as tanks are going through the street. Yeah. And no one seemed to be bothered by this. I was like, okay. <laughs> well, and we were thrown off because we had just moved here, so we didn't have our bearings yet. Like, we, had, we didn't know what was what, right? Yeah. So it's not really the kind of welcome you want when you move to a new town, like to be greeted by army planes yeah. and soldiers and... I never, I mean, we never thought that was an invasion or anything, but it's just like another reminder of how militarized and on edge this place well, can be. I thought like maybe the the government had some sort of, you know, secret knowledge and they were starting to move their troops into position and not telling people or something. Like I was kind of freaked out. But... At the time, Korea's president was Moon Jae-in, who was all about bending over backwards to appease North Korea and try to get money into North Korea and distance himself from the U.S. His political party is pro-North Korean. So the idea of war breaking out under him seemed very uh, unlikely. But now we have a new conservative president who's kind of a soft conservative. He's not ultra-right wing or McCarthyist or anything like that. He's still going ahead with a lot of ill-advised unification schemes with North Korea, in part because the pro-North Korea political party has a supermajority in the National Assembly, and they could impeach him basically whenever they want. So he goes along with a lot of the pro-North Korean um, policies that the old guy was slowly implementing. And uh, so when the fireworks were happening the other day, I was like, eh, they could be trying, they, maybe something happened, they're trying to send the conservative guy a message. I don't know, but then it turned out it was fireworks. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I was like, oh, yeah, thank Whoa. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, like, as much as I've tried not to think about the fact that we live so close to North Korea, you know, it it constantly pops up because if you just hop online and check out the English version of the Korean Times, I mean, at least a few times a month, I feel like there's something like North Korea just sent off a new nuclear test or North Korea is sending drones or, you know, some guy was captured on an island off the side or there's like weird things that are pretty much continually happening with North yeah. North Korea. North Korea sent a few drones into South Korea, into Seoul and along the coast the day after Christmas. So that was about... A, a little over a month ago. So yeah. that was the latest thing. And, the you know, there's more missile tests and probably more nuke tests coming up. Well, and when we were in Jeju, we never figured out what this was. But one night we were out late walking around the island and we saw a boat on fire, like way out in the distance. And so we Googled to see if we could find anything on the news and we never did. Did you ever find out what that was about? Was it a fisherman? Our thing, co-worker's or? husband is a fisherman. He's like, yeah, there was a fire. And... The our coworker was a little nervous talking about it. It was yeah, she didn't really strange. Get much it was happening during a point of tension mm -hmm. with North Korea. It was very strange. So I don't know if don't know what that was. was some like they they torpedoed a boat just to just to kind of hint that they're uh, in control of negotiations. Oh, yeah, it was never on the news or anything. Uh, but it could have just you know been nothing. Yeah, we don't know. 
But uh, in case you But think, this is how you think when you're in a career. You're always thinking like, oh, is it something? Or at least I am. Yeah, I mean, in case you think we're paranoid, uh, this will, will walk you through some of North Korea's greatest hits and uh, how recently they were. But first we should probably talk about what North Korea is. And a lot of people just think, well, it's a scary place where people are kind of <laughs> poor and pushed around by a crazy dictator. With a funny haircut. With a funny haircut. <laughs> yeah, last guy's haircut was funnier than, oh, yeah. than the current guy. who. This one's so portly. He always reminds me of Butthead. Oh. His hair shaves the sides. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so, a very unique do. So we, another thing uh, that we should mention is we went to the demilitarized zone mm -hmm. uh, a while ago, yeah. years ago. And I think they stopped doing the tours um, since then. But that was the most interesting thing that I did in Korea that time. And then in case you don't know, the demilitarized zone is the area. It's the border between North and South Korea. And I don't know why they call it demilitarized zone, but... It is extremely militarized. Yeah. There's barbed wire and mines. Soldiers and watching you with binoculars soldiers. from the other side. It was the freakiest thing. Yeah, we went to the uh, Panmunjom, which is the little, the little uh, building that's on the border, where they occasionally meet for ceremonial signing of agreements and such. And. I believe that's where they signed the 1953 armistice, which suspended but did not formally end the Korean War. And uh, so we went to this official building and walked around the big table, which straddles the border. So technically, we've both been to North Korea. And yeah, we walked over the line, didn't we? Yeah, we were in, yeah. in the room over the line. and I wouldn't do that again, though. I would, I but it's know. like the room was empty. There weren't any North Koreans there, but... After hanging out in North Korea for a minute, I was like, you know, I, I think I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I just remember the soldiers on the other side of the border on steps, like looking at us through binoculars and writing notes in these little notepads. Scowling. They yeah, they look so scary. Yeah. I mean, they were putting on a performance, but you could tell they really didn't like us. Oh, it was just, I don't know. I didn't, I'm glad we're not there anymore. I don't want to go back. Yeah. That was really interesting. They let us look through binoculars at the fake North Korean city mm -hmm. that they had with a giant flag, remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, giant flag over this fake, fake town. Remember, they were North... in competition. Yeah, they were in competition. I think at one point, they each side was bringing a bigger and bigger flag. Like, who has the bigger flag, North or South yeah. Korea? So, North Korea's city, or I guess town, it's a... No one lives there. There's a couple of custodians, one of which, one of whom I saw through the binoculars, like walking around with a broom, but no one else with a giant flag. And South Korea, they have actually a town near the border, and people get like tax benefits to stay there. So uh, they're in competition. Yes, mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. So that's a weird. That was probably the most interesting thing that I did in Korea. Uh, long ago but okay let's start with all right shamar what do you think of when you think of north korea well i think of oh i saw a documentary in north korea once and it was showing the big parades that they have with the tanks and then all the little kids who are you doing acrobats and like they just like their skill level is just insane what these little kids can do and like perfectly timed um and i don't know i think i've seen some documentaries where somebody's like maybe kind of undercover and it's super dangerous but somehow they got some footage and everything seemed very uh like by the book like the people who went on a tour it was very specific you go to specific places and that's all you can see and they have you know and they have a certain the, the tour guides can only say certain things and if you ask too many questions well that's not actually really allowed so uh, the tour guys always looked kind of nervous too yeah i don't know so i don't really know much about korea other than what i've seen through documentaries mm -hmm. right yeah well you can't really say you know much about North Korea, unless you know a little bit about 
Kim Il-sung, who was the founder. So Kim Il-sung is not his real name. He was born Kim sung ju and he changed his name when he was a communist guerrilla fighter against the Japanese. To He changed his name to Kim Il-sung, which means becoming the son. So he, uh, this guy uh, was born to Presbyterian parents in North Korea. And when the Japanese were in control of all of Korea, they were pretty brutal around the years of 1919, 1920. And so they were trying to clean up all the resistance. And so his parents moved him, his family, to northeastern China when he was eight years old. And so he grew up largely in China. And his only schooling was in China. He got eight years of formal schooling. And he uh, pretty quickly, when he was a teenager, joined anti-Japanese communist organizations. And he eventually joined the Chinese communist-led Northeast Anti-Japanese United Army, which was dominated by Koreans. There were a lot of Koreans who fled to northeastern China um, with the hopes of being able to liberate Korea from Japan eventually. But uh, eventually there is a big purge in the 1930s and the communists in China say, you know what, we don't really trust Koreans because a lot of you might be spies sent by fascist Japan to spy on the communists here. So, um, all, like, a, let's see, is a thousand Koreans were purged from the communist movement, and about 500 were killed on the charges of being suspected spies for Japan. But Kim Il-sung, according to his own memoirs, and this could be just totally made up, he took all the files of the Communist Party's purge committee and burnt them. And apparently all the Koreans who had been purged and were hiding from the Chinese communists came out of the woodwork and were like, yes, let's rally behind you. You you saved us from being killed by the other Chinese communists. So the survivors of the purge rallied around Kim when he was about 24, at least officially this is what happened. He raids a town in Korea uh, later when he's, I think, 24. Five or so, yeah. And he sets fire to some Japanese colonial buildings, including an elementary school. He loots from some local people. And he fights this little battle in a largely undefended town in northern Korea. And then he dips back across the border into China. And this is really the only battle that people say uh, Kim Il-sung was involved in. And There's some evidence that the guy who led this raid was another dude named Choi Hyun. And uh, so even his one big battle against the Japanese might have been fabricated. Anyway, after this, he moves to Russia and is trained by the Soviets, becomes a major in the Soviet Red Army. And according to Soviet files, he hardly even speaks Korean. He's... His understanding of of communism is kind of minimal. He's not very educated. He doesn't. He hasn't really been to Korea in a long time. Um, he spent most of his life at that point in China. Um, eventually, World War Two ends. China or er, Japan loses to the United States. The Soviet Union starts swooping into Korea later on. Or towards the very end. And the U.S. nukes Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, by the way, when Hiroshima was nuked, there was about 30,000 Koreans who were incinerated in the atomic bombing. And those are the most Koreans who died in the war um, Hmm. from military activity. Um, Anyway, so... Korea gets liberated. The Soviets come in from the north. The U.S. comes in from the south. Right before the Japanese pull out, they find a nationalist guy, a left-leaning dude, and they say, uh, look, uh, we need to make sure that 
the remaining Japanese people aren't all massacred by angry Koreans as we pull out. So we need to put you in charge of a committee for the preparation for Korean independence. Can you just guarantee that you won't massacre Japanese people as we pull out? He's like, sure, but you need to give us three months of food and release all political prisoners and give us uh, free reign to set up committees and organize the country. And the Japanese were like, okay, sure. So all these political prisoners get released. Um, and they said, no, no Japanese collaborators are allowed in our movement. And uh, so they set up committees all over Korea to tell everyone, hey, the war's over, Japan lost. And they set up what's called the Korean People's Republic in both North and South. And the Soviets come in and they immediately take over all of those and put it under their control. And the Americans come in and they just don't know anything about Korea. And they immediately are like, uh, Japan put you in charge? No, they just lost. Um, so what the Americans do is they take over the Japanese colonial bureaucracy and staff it filled with right wing staff it full of right wing Koreans, and they make mistake after mistake after mistake. So um, all these committees are mostly disbanded in the south, except for Jejudo, where they have control of the island and. Uh, the right-wing government that the U.S. Um, installed uh, starts suppressing these committees, and it gets pretty brutal. So in the South, where the U.S. is in charge, it's just chaos, um, in part because it's just the aftermath of a war, but also in part because the Soviet, Unions are, is, Soviet Union is setting up a regime in the north that's very harsh and they start doing some things that are crowd pleasing like redistributing land giving women equal rights things like that but they start suppressing religion freedom of speech all that and so pretty quickly there are about let's see how many um i think i wrote this down uh 338,000 north koreans flee to South Korea, which is already in chaos. Um, not a lot of people flee north because they don't like all the uh, totalitarian institutions being set up. But then even more Koreans that during the war were working in China and Japan f all return to South Korea. And so there's over 2 million Koreans that are that just flood into South Korea. They make it even more chaotic because there's not a lot of uh, order. The economy is in ruins because of the war. Um, but unfortunately, there's, there's strikes. There's violent uprisings directed by the North. The North is not its own independent government yet. It's still under Soviet occupation. Um, this, the communists directed out of the North start... Uh, attacking police officers, murdering their families, that kind of thing. And the government that the U.S. is trying to set up is really brutal and very right-wing, and they start suppressing opposition, and it gets worse and worse. Anyway, the U.S. and the Soviet Union never wanted to divide the uh, peninsula. And they had agreed, yeah, let's unify the place, but the question is how. So the U.S. and the Soviet Union says, we need to ask the United Nations to do this, to figure out how to unify the country. So the U.N. thinks about it, and they say, okay, let's have elections to unify the peninsula in 1948. But the North that the Soviet Union dom dominates, they completely refuse to have these elections. They say they're sham, we're not going to do it. And in the South, all the left-wing people and organizations, they boycott the elections and even try to disrupt them. So when the left-wing in the South boycotts the elections, oh boy, the right-wing dominates. And so the government that's quickly set up later that year in the South 
the Republic of Korea that's officially proclaimed in August 1948. It's dominated by right-wing people because the left wing refused to participate in elections. And pretty soon after, about three weeks later, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is set up in the north. So now you've officially got South and North Korea. Anyway, there's more chaos and strikes, and the North is infiltrating the South, causing uprisings and chaos as much as they can. The right-wing government is pretty much inept. The U.S. tries to uh, get the government to do things like land reform, but it's a mess. And uh, anyway, there's a eventually 1950, a couple years later, uh, the North... North Korea invades the South. And before then, the South was kind of a vague socialist, vague socialist sentiment throughout the country. But during the Korean War, when North Korea would enter a town, basically what would happen is um, all the North Korea, pro North Korean spies would come out of the woodwork and single out their neighbors that are pro government or right wing. And the North Koreans would often either take them away to be tortured and killed or just shoot them right in front of everyone. And that is the most, one of the most traumatic elements of the, of the Korean War to people in the South. That generation that remembers it is remembering their neighbors and loved ones. Whoa, turns out that they're murderous spies and can't be trusted all along. Mm. So seeing that uh, completely radicalize radicalizes the South Korean population from being kind of vaguely socialist to becoming hard right wing. They say, whatever communism is, we don't want that. So in the 50s, the South Korean population turns hard to the right. Anyway, that's enough of South Korea. What's going on in North Korea? Well, Kim Il-sung, that guy who was fighting the Japanese, at least officially, who was installed by the Soviet Union to be kind of their their founder. He immediately starts consolidating power. He's the guy who really wanted to invade the South and was behind that. He got the Soviet Union and China to sign on. He starts rehabilitating pro-Japanese propagandists, the same people who worked for Japan. He said, I'm so forgiving. You can come work for me and help build my cult of personality. And so he takes over, but there's different factions. There's the people that he knew personally when he was fighting in northern China, or northeastern China. There's a Soviet faction of ethnic Koreans who grew up in the Soviet Union but hadn't really set foot in Korea for over a generation. There's a Chinese faction that's close to Mao Zedong. And there are communists who never left the peninsula. So... Um, he sidelines, have these people executed, kills his rivals, so does the Soviet Union. And eventually he starts purging these factions enough that finally the Soviets and the Chinese say, this guy is kind of dumb. He's kind of dumb and brutal. Let's replace him. So the Soviets and Chinese try to have him removed at a central committee meeting in 1956, but they fail. And Kim Il-sung wipes them all out. And he gets even more hardline, having survived this coup attempt. So he starts something called the Songbun caste system the next year, 1957, which divides the entire population into about 50 subgroups of people based on their background and how trustworthy they are. And that system exists today. It determines how many privileges you have, and it's it's multi-generational. It goes back to who you were, who your ancestors were at the time of uh, the establishment of North Korea. So he gorges himself on massive foreign aid from Soviet Union and China, and he builds up his industry. The South is still in chaos. They just could not get their economy in order. But uh, one thing people forget is that when Ch Japan was colonizing, was in control of Korea, they, most of their industry was in the north. So when North Korea was proclaimed, they had most of the factories and all that. So 
They had more industrial capacity to begin with, and then they get all this foreign aid from the communist world. And um, so North Korea gets harder and harder, but their economy is doing, doing all right. They're rebuilding from the war. Um, let's see. Next, there's kind of a lull uh, until the 1960s when the United States gets involved in the Vietnam War. And Kim Il-sung says, ah, the Americans are distracted in Vietnam. Maybe we can start uh, escalating tensions in Korea. So they start doing guerrilla attacks along the demilitarized zone where we visited. And hundreds of people died. They tried infiltration from the sea to set up mountain guerrilla camps and spark an uprising in South Korea. Did not work, but they were... Not for lack of trying. Remember when we went to Sorokson, we saw those signs along the beach? Oh, yeah. They were saying, like, yeah, if you see a, a bunch of people emerging from a submarine, uh, let us know. And Could... they had, like, number to call, like, special number to call. So I guess it still does happen. Yeah. North Korea sending these spy submarines. Uh-huh. Yeah. And there's observation towers along the coast. So, yeah. yeah. So the DMZ conflict lasted about three years uh, lots of attempted infiltration, a lot of little mini battles along the border with South Korea. A lot of Americans died, and even more North and South Koreans. That seemed to be going nowhere, um, but um, kind of at the high point of that, they do a suicide commando mission to attack the Blue House, which is the equivalent of the White House here in South Korea, to kill the president of South Korea. So this commando mission, these commandos infiltrate South Korea. They kill about 26, yeah, they kill 26 South Koreans in the process and with the goal of storming, storming the Blue House and murdering the president. Well, that didn't work. They all got wiped out or captured. Um, Three days later during this conflict, uh, they capture a U.S. uh, intelligence ship, like a spy ship which is off the coast of Korea. By most accounts, it was in international waters, but North Korea claims that they don't recognize international boundaries. They say, we control the waters, I think, 50 kilometers out rather than the international standard of 12. So they grabbed this spy ship, which had 43 crews, 43 crew members in it, and... After seizing the ship, they tortured the entire crew for about 11 months straight. Um, So North Koreans really don't like Americans. In fact, during the war, the Chinese had to keep reminding the North Koreans to stop murdering murdering American prisoners every time they were captured. They were like, dude, we can bargain for their release later. And the North Koreans were like, no, let's just kill them all. (laughs) So... Let's see. So after they captured this ship, the USS Pueblo, um, the next year they shoot down a spy plane, which was well outside of North Korean territory. They shoot it down with fighter planes and they kill everyone on board. Um, Five years later, they try to assassinate the president. He's a dictator, but he's the leader of South Korea and they miss him. So instead of killing the president, they kill his wife instead while he's giving a speech. And hard old guy that he is, he just kept giving the speech while they dragged his wife what? away. <laughs> yeah. No. Wait, which president? The South Korean president. Oh. Yeah, he was kind of a hard, cold... They killed di- the wife in the middle of a speech? Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. So his daughter had to take uh, first lady duties oh. from then on. So... Um, yeah, so it's just kind of constant, uh, constant tensions with North Korea. So um, anyway, back to 1967, there was an, one final attempt to remove Kim Il-sung from power. From He'd eliminated almost all the factions around him, but then there was a group of people who knew him from his anti-Japanese days in North Korea, and they say, look, you're pretty crazy and uh, you're not that good of a dictator we need to fix the economy and we need to tone down the cult of personality 
And so they try to remove them at another meeting, and they fail, and they're all wiped out. So as a result of that attempt in 1967, um, it gets even crazier. Mm. And this is when the Chinese revolution, or the Chinese cultural revolution is going on in China, where fanatics are destroying all the relics of the old order, and just there's carnage and big public shaming sessions and murder, mm -hmm. rampant chaos, pandemonium in China. Um, as a result of the attempted coup against Kim Il-sung, he appoints his son, Kim Jong-il, to be head of propaganda. And he later takes over North Korea later. But Kim Jong-il, his son, becomes propaganda boss and he starts copying the Chinese and making the cult even crazier. So he makes Juche a uh, important part, a central part of their ideology. If you know anything about Juche, it literally translate as uh, translates as subjectivism, meaning like subject versus object. Subject is the thing that moves and object is the thing that is moved. So it's a fake ideology. It's really it's designed to be praised so that Kim Il Sung can say that he's an original political thinker, and but no one knows anything about it. If you just, I mean, no one in North Korea really knows anything about it. Um, you can read books and books of that stuff, and it, they just repeat themselves about how humans can do anything if they put their mind to it. That's basically what it is. So um, anyway, the propaganda gets crazier and crazier. It gets more and more racist. If you look at the becomes less communist and more and more culty and racist. Um, remember, what they want more than anything is to unify the peninsula. They call the southern, uh, southern pro-American governments like a, a colony of the U.S. And their propaganda, if you look at it, it's been compared to Nazi propaganda from uh, the lead-up to World War II, where... Americans are depicted as having giant noses and sunken eyes and kind of looking, they kind of look uh, like insects or non-human. And a lot of their propaganda is about how uh, America is a degenerate, hopelessly evil society because it's multiracial and, and only the North Koreans are the pure race. Like So it's not really communist. It's kind of incidentally communist, but it becomes more and more about racial purity. Anyway, as time goes on, um, 1983, there's the Rangoon bombing uh, where uh, North Korean agents try to blow up the president of South Korea when he's meeting with his cabinet in the capital of Burma. So he kills four cabinet members, the spy, and 21 people are killed. The president survives, but uh, that was a pretty big one. And... Uh, and during the 80s, they're infiltrating the pro-democracy movement. So a lot of the people in South Korea who want an end to the dictatorship are going back and forth to North Korea and singing the praises of Kim Il-sung. So um, anyway, the Cold War ends in 1991, officially. And Kim Il-sung, the founder, he dies in 1994. And right when he dies, uh, something happens, which is since the Soviet Union dissolves, they stop showering him with foreign aid and buying, buying junk from, generous, from North Korea at generous prices. And they stop giving North Korea all the oil and fertilizer for dirt cheap that they used to. And the entire economy just falls apart. The wheels come off. They don't have fertilizer for their crops. And in North Korea, which is very mountainous, uh, they were really dependent on fertilizer. Uh, their tractors start rusting. They don't have spare parts. Mass famine. There's weather disasters, floods. So in the minds of North Koreans who are really into this cult of personality, the moment the founder dies, they have all this famine and starvation and death and the economy collapses. So, uh, interesting timing. But his son, the guy who started, who intensified the cult of propaganda, or the cult of personality, uh, Kim Jong-il, he takes over, and 
he really pushes ahead with the nuclear program throughout the 90s. Um, there's na small naval battles in the late 1990s. Um, so there's still ongoing provocations. Their starvation is so bad that uh, I think about anywhere between, some people say 3.5 million died in North Korea. Mm -hmm. It's as low as a quarter million. It might be more like half a million. We don't know, but North Koreans are shorter and uh, mm -hmm. more malnourished and... Uh, yeah, it was really bad. People were eating the bark off of trees and all that. And they eventually, um, massive food aid came in from the international community, which they promptly stockpiled and gave to the military, while most of the people continued to starve. Interesting fact, um, the American food aid uh, that came in they used in their propaganda they told the people that it was reparations for the americans being so evil and so look at how smart we are to squeeze these reparations out of the americans and when all this food aid was coming in and people continued to starve uh, the uh, budget for food in north korea was cut proportionately so they thought, oh, we've got free food. Now we don't have to pay for food for our own people. So let's just cut that and put the money into our military program. And so they continued their secret nuke program, their missile program, buying helicopters and stuff from other countries and building giant monuments to their cult of personality. And just canceling the monuments alone would have given them enough food to feed the entire population. But... They preferred to spend money on the military. Anyway, um, let's see. So by then, Kim Il-sung is, or Kim Jong-il, is starting to get old. He um, is probably having strokes at this point. Um, but the South Korean government, they elect a guy who's pro-North Korean, Kim Dae-jung. He says, we're going to have a sunshine policy where we're nice to North Korea, so they'll be nice to us, and we can live in peace and not think about those artillery uh, pieces mounted across the border. Won't that be nice? So they secretly, they have a summit where they declare that they're going to lower tensions, and the cost of that summit, it turned out later, they had to take a half-billion-dollar bribe from Hyundai Corporation that the president arranged to be sent to North Korea. Who knows what they did with that money? Probably bought more nuclear material. I don't know. But um, let's see. So they started getting money from the South as part of the Sunshine Policy. But later they elected a... The South Koreans elect a right-wing guy, and the North Koreans didn't like that, so... Uh, they started bombing. Uh, they started with a, uh, let's see, first they sank a Navy ship in 2010, and then they bombarded Yongpyeon Island, also in 2010, and were ratcheting up tensions. And to this day, I'm not sure if that's, if it was just to teach a lesson to the new conservative government, which was less enthusiastic about... Uh, sucking up to North Korea, or if it was to uh, help train the incoming third president of, or third leader of North Korea how much, uh, how to kill. They're like, all right, boy, you're going to take over? You need to press this big red button and get some blood on your hands. Kaboom. I don't know. That's just possibility but in any case they blew up a uh, ship and shelled an island and the next year the guy who's in power now kim jong-un takes over and because his father dies officially due to a massive heart attack but uh, who knows he was already having strokes and such and getting more and more debilitated kim jong-un takes over a lot of people think well maybe he's a reformer you know, maybe he'll kind of loosen things up and cut back on the crazy military nuke tests and everything. And 
Well, pretty quickly, he kills his uncle uh, by firing squad in 2013. And then... Hmm? What did he, didn't he invite Dennis Rodman over there? Yeah, he did. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people thought he's a reformer because he, he's inviting Dennis Rodman over. Yeah, when he had like dyed hair and stuff. I, I don't I know what know, his maybe. hair was like, but he did, wouldn't even take off his hat and sunglasses when he was meeting the new, the brand new young leader of North Korea, which is just, considering how racist North Korea is and like, how everyone bows to the Kim, like this has been basketball player hanging out with him with like a nose piercings and stuff, like how and like, his sunglasses in his cap in his cap, like <laughs> how. That must have clashed with their propaganda and undermined everything. Yeah, not. So I, I think that was just Kim Jong Un. He's like, well, I now that I'm dictator, I want some perks. Let's yeah. let's meet Dennis Rodman because people who knew him when he was going to private school in Switzerland said, uh, let's, yeah, like the kid wasn't very that wasn't very interesting, but he really liked basketball. Interesting. So what weird. <laughs> so his big fantasy. Let's have some. Let's get some uh, North Korean basketball teams together, and I'll hang out with Dennis Rodman. <laughs> wow! And, and we'll get drunk on soju and have a grand old time. So wait, who was the person that was killed with the like, the, the poison on the handkerchief or something? Yeah. Or was that... I was about to get to that. Oh. Yeah, after people thought he was going to be a reformer, uh, meeting with Dennis Rodman and having opening a bunch of amusement parks and things like that, kind of to show everyone, like, oh, the famine's over, We've, we're going to have good times again. Um, it pretty much turned out uh, immediately after the euphoria ended um, that he is as much of a brute as any other leader North Korea could come up with. So first he drags his uncle out of a big meeting and accuses him of uh, being a in charge of a faction that wants to overthrow him and institute reforms. So he has him killed and dragged, which is another big no-no in their propaganda. In North Korea, they're all about our government is stable. There are no factions. We are like the divine dynasty that we have stability where, while the U.S. has all these like sleazy elections and is always in chaos and can be jerked around. Uh, we're the only ones who have a government that really functions so he went out of his way to drag his uncle out of this big meeting and have him killed which undermined the propaganda system again and next was his half-brother in 2017 who lived in macau and he always said he said yeah maybe we could have a constitutional monarchy kind of like like thailand or something and where the kim family will remain some ceremonial heads and we can start instituting democratic reforms. He started making noise like that. And, uh, Kim Jong-un, the new leader says, yeah, he's got to go. So he had people poison him with chemical weapons in the Kuala Lumpur airport. So remember that's the capital of Malaysia. Oh, it was in the Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. yeah. Some of the details are hazy, but the people oh. who were, like trained to do it they used cutouts so the people who actually did it i believe they were told that there was some kind of reality show yeah, sort of thing know. so yeah. there, there's two different types of chemicals for this chemical weapon i think it was vx and you put them together and that's when it kills you so they had i think two people with handkerchiefs that ran up to him at the same time and when he was in the airport and he died pretty quick so uh yeah so he kills any potential rivals, and yeah, pretty brutal. So he is firmly in charge. He doesn't seem to know what he's doing, but he's getting the hang of it more. His voice is getting a little more confident when he gives speeches, and he gives a lot of speeches, unlike his father, the middle leader, who I think he only gave two big public speeches. But this guy is becoming... a more and more confident he's learning how the how the buttons work so to speak so in the south uh, meanwhile after he killed his bro after uh, Kim Jong-un kills his brother they have an impeachment of a conservative president and then the new guy who comes in is super pro-North Korea this is 
2017, the same year that uh, that Kim Jong Un killed his brother. So we fill in the South. Moon Jae-in, the guy who comes in, he fills his cabinet with pro-North activists, including people who've firebombed American, uh, American cultural centers, that kind of thing. A lot of them have criminal records. Um, he, in the South, they become really pro-North Korean. They're all constantly talking about reunification. And so they turn up the propaganda in the South to be pro North Korean. It's kind of it was kind of weird to watch. I was here for a lot of it. And after about a year of this pro North Korean propaganda by the president in the south, 78% of Koreans polled said they trust Kim Jong Un. So 70% 78% of South Koreans say they trust the guy who just murdered his own brother with chemical weapons in an airport wow. like a year earlier. <laughs> So, um, yeah, a little, quite a bit of dysfunction in the South. Anyway, um, so then, of course, the pandemic happens, and uh, the borders are closed with North Korea, and uh, that creates an even bigger economic catastrophe in the South, or in the North, rather. And uh, so North Korea is even more isolated than it was before. Um Meanwhile, we just recently had last year a conservative president who narrowly got elected in the South. And the whole reunification craze that the last president started is so uh, firmly entrenched here in the South that the conservative's unification minister right now says he wants to make North propaganda legal and available to all, to audiences across South Korea not just available. He says it's he says it's to promote racial homogeneity across the Korean Peninsula. Why are you telling me this? Like he's going to put it on the television and stuff. Yeah, they haven't right. implemented it yet, but he says, That's yeah, crazy. we need to make TV and radio, the internet, everything, all available to South Koreans, which seems not just legal but available, which means subsidize it basically. So. Um, Meanwhile, they estimate between ten to 40,000 active North Korean agents are working in the South, where we live today, and they have a rough estimate of how many there are because they send coded radio messages back to the North. They can kind of tell how many people are doing it. Um, let's see. So the unification plan has not been stopped by the the conservative government it's just kind of frozen here but uh this unification craze that's going on it's been a long-term plan of north korea for decades and generally what we know that based on eastern european archives from the cold war what north korea has been planning to do is rope the South into a kind of confederation that the North would dominate, and then they could slowly squeeze out uh, resistance out of the South and then eventually take over. So the plan right now with their nuke program is to eventually threaten the U.S. with nuclear missiles and scare the U.S. into signing a peace treaty, which will officially end the Korean War. And with that peace treaty, of course, the U.S. would probably withdraw troops from the South, and then the South would be able to bully the South. I'm sorry, the North would be able to bully the South into a North-dominated confederation, and then eventually they'd be able to reunify. And in the South, a lot of people are in favor of this. There's a big chunk, maybe about 30% of the population, which is pro-North. They might not like the idea of being taken over by the North, but every time there's any politician that says we need to get closer to the North and further away from the U.S., they're in favor of it. And the hardcore anti-North people are maybe about 25%. So there's there's more hardcore pro-North people than there are hardcore anti-North people, with a lot of people in the middle who just don't pay attention to politics. Um so what has North Korea been doing lately? Um, cyber attacks, about 8% of the economy is supported by ransomware type cyber crimes. Uh, the average income for North Koreans is about $1 to $3 a month. 
Uh, the most recent escapee that I read about works. One to three dollars a month. Yeah, according to official, like, well, not official, but black market exchange. Not even a day? No, a month. What? Yeah. And yeah, mandatory mil- military service is 10 years for men. Um, and all soldiers are uh, encouraged to grow their own food because they don't have enough food to pay for everyone. Mm. The military is used for as slave labor for shoddy construction projects, and they're always saying, oh, we need to, w- we need to finish this big rickety dam or stadium three years ahead of schedule, and of course it cracks if there's ever an earthquake. And a lot of this... A lot of people theorize these slave labor projects are just to keep the population exhausted so they can't ever think of overthrowing the government. Um, Fun fact, there's 28 state-approved haircuts. Really? Including the lady mullet. The lady mullet? Yeah. What? It's one of 14 haircuts that women can get is a mullet. How can they even afford to pay for a haircut if they get a dollar a month? Uh, I think you can do it. A kind of crappy haircut for free, or yeah, pretty, pretty cheap. It's not a very capital intensive, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, enterprise. Uh, let's see. They of the some people escaped to China, um, not a ton, um, and a lot of people say a lot of people who escaped to China return. They bribe their way out and then they bribe their way back, which a lot of analysts say like, yeah, the population supports their government. They really believe in the propaganda that. They're part of the divine mission to reunify the Korean race and drive the Americans out of the peninsula. So the population pretty much supports the government. That was what the last escapee that I read about said. They're like, yeah, we're very proud of the nuke program, but I was working 16 hours a day in a factory, and that doesn't count the one to two hours a day I had to spend every day cleaning up the... uh, the statues of the regime in my village. Um, so most of the refugees are refugees. The escapees come from the northeast of the country, not not the capital um, where everyone's spied on, and uh, but taken care of compared to the rest of the population. Um, so when people come back from China and you happen to be pregnant or you have a kid, um, watch out because... They will often throw you in prison, and they will forcibly abort mixed-race fetuses, and they'll kill your mixed-race babies from China. That's like a government policy, because it's a racist. They're into racial purity. And let's see, what else? The diplomats around the world are involved in drug trafficking, crystal meth, that kind of thing. They've been helping Syria with their quasi-genocidal civil war by providing help with chemical weapons, and they work with Iran on their missile and nuclear program. And thinking about that big artillery, uh, all those artillery pieces mounted along the border, which could hit us, um, also important to remember that North Korea has the third biggest chemical weapons stockpile in the world. That's freaky. And, yeah, it would just fry people. I mean, yikes. But, yeah, they could all, they could wipe out Seoul pretty bad. Um, So they've been building their nukes with the intention of driving, pressuring the U.S. to withdraw troops, sign a peace treaty. And uh, so it's not like they would just attack with nukes one day. It's more like now that they've got nukes, they can, if they wanted to, and say there's a conservative government they don't like, they could start attacking islands, sinking ships, and increase the amount of violent provocations that they could do knowing that they've got nukes mm-hmm. um, that would make the, make the South think twice before retaliating. Mm-hmm. So they can do that to punish a conservative government. And to be honest, it's weird. When the North attacks the South with these little incidences, uh, like Yongpyeong Island or the Chunin uh, sinking... Uh, the population doesn't really freak out and rally around the South. They're just kind of like, well, it was an island that's kind of far from the mainland. And uh, the ship, we don't really know what happened. So maybe we should elect a pro-North guy because he can keep the tensions down. And it, it, So, it, yeah, attacking South Korean targets works. 
And I got to say, one of the first things I noticed when I came to Korea was my students, they would always, I thought occasionally maybe North Korea would come up. It almost never comes up. And if they talk about the world outside of Korea, they also never refer to South Korea as South Korea. They just say Korea. And, but they save all their hate for Japan. That's the weird thing. Like, they're kind of sympathetic to North Korea, but have just a lot of hatred for Japan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids have said the anti Japanese propaganda campaigns that the government uh, supports or will fan the flames of every few years or so. Last time, all the kids, the students were like, oh, I'm not playing Pokemon cards anymore. Oh, no, I'm not going to yeah. do that. Japan's bad. And yeah. Do you ever get any J Japanese references from your students? A little bit here and there. Not so much. I mean, they always talk about the, there's a certain island. What is it? Ducto Island? Ducto Island. Where it's, they say it's it's ours. And then the other, and they're like, no, it's Japanese. I don't know. And they're, they're like very adamant about the fact that it's Korea's. Yeah. I think more people care about Ducto, this disputed island, which internationally everyone recognizes it's part of Korean waters. Part of Korean territory. It's between Korea and Japan. But there are occasionally right wing politicians in Japan who claim that it should be Japan's and uh, or that it is Japan's. And every time someone says anything like that in Japan, people in Korea freak out and they say, oh, we've got to defend against the Japanese invaders who used to be our colonial masters. And uh, it's weird. They freak out about Japan. But when North Korea bombs an island. They're like, eh, whatever. We'll, I don't really want to think about it. No, so yeah. let's, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So the unification process is going on. Uh, it's continuing slowly now that there's a conservative government. Um, the nuclear program with missiles capable of hitting the U.S., that's continuing at the same time, the economy of the North is in shambles. It's, a lot of it's supported by criminal activity um, and slave labor. And uh, that's kind of where we're at. Mm -hmm. any, any further reflections about this? I don't want to, I don't really want to dwell on the bad things too mm -hmm. much, but it's just kind of like we're in Korea, so we have to talk about North Korea yeah. sooner or later. But what do you, what do you think? Any thoughts? Uh, well, does it put your life in America in perspective? Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, and you know, yeah, in America, I would not be like living my life and in the background thinking about, oh, we could possibly be attacked. Like it, it is different living here. It is in the back of your head. There's always that like, what if? You know, I mean, I guess something could happen in the U.S., but you're pretty safe over there. But here, I mean, we're literally, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles from North Korea. And even if like when we were in Jeju, even there, you're still not that far. And to think that North Korea has, what did you say, the third biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons and chemical weapons, ke chemical, sorry, chemical weapons and uh, this kind of crazy leader. Yeah, it just it can make you a little bit nervous, but I mean, like we said before, just try not to think about it too much because honestly, what are we going to do? We're here, so we just kind of live our lives. But it is a little bit in the background, for sure, mm -hmm. which is something when living in the U.S., of course, I don't really think about it. In the U.S., uh, we kind of put out, we put gun massacres out of our minds. Yeah, right. <laughs> like we tune out gun massacres, which can happen. Yeah. But exactly. here everyone tunes out the possibility of a apocalyptic chemical nuclear war yeah, out of their minds exactly so, yeah best not to think about just certain don't think about people it, just yeah. want to give on get on with their lives and they've got their own problems yeah so uh yeah but i guess that's i mean i think that's about it that was a lot of good information and history um so much has happened here it's such a small country and yet it has such a crazy mm -hmm. history they're crazy, very brutal. Although I gotta say, I want to emphasize this: I I don't think Kim Jong Un is crazy, and I don't think North Korea is. I mean, it's crazy from the perspective of a decent human being, but.
but as far as it being irrational, they, it, know what they're doing. they know what they're doing. They know exactly how to jerk around the South. They know exactly how to jerk around the United States. They know how to play this long game with this silly North dominated confederation reunification talks. It's been working. Yeah. So it's, it's working on, on that level. And also their economy is still just hopelessly behind. So mm -hmm. maybe the whole, I mean, right now the place is just dominated by the black market while the people generally support the regime. And uh, will the totally collapsed economy bring down the government uh, faster than North Korea can rope the South into a... a confederation where they can dominate and eventually take over i mean yeah that's what i'm curious about like what will become of korea north and south like i mean how long is this going to go on where there's this this split this border this demilitarized zone and north a north korea and a separate south korea like eventually that's going to have to end or come to a head something's going to have to happen so i hope that when it does it is done peacefully i think after living here now for four and a half years well i mean we were and we were here once before like if if it ended up being really violent, I mean, I would just feel so much for the people here just because I've met so many Koreans. I've taught so many of them, you know, like all the kids I've taught are here, all the people I've met, like they're going to be living here for the rest of their lives, mostly. So when this, I don't know, I don't know how it's going to finally come to an end. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I think, I think, um... It's been pointed out that because North Korea, by the way, they deleted the reference, all references to communism from their constitution back in 2009. Mm. So they, they're not even really pretending to be communist anymore. They're, but more things change, the more things stay the same. Yeah. So they say that was, I mean, it's purely symbolic, but symbolism is noticeable that uh, they... They're really just making it clearer and clearer that they're not motivated by international class struggle or by their, their Marxist theory of being superior to the capitalist West and they can race ahead of us using their superior economic system. Their ideology that holds the whole society together is racism and ultranationalism, Korean supremacy. So... When things go bad in North Korea, they can blame America. They can blame outsiders. And when things go well, they can say, uh, see how special we are? So nationalism is really, it's a, a lot hard, harder to collapse than communism, which as soon as the economy is just completely, just obviously like your communist system that we're supposed to rally behind clearly doesn't work, then boom, your regime's over. But this one, yeah, they, a lot of the people who flee to the South because they can't bear it anymore, a lot of them still feel guilty like they've betrayed the Korean race. So the North Korea is more interested in reunification than South Korea is. So they're in the driver's seat uh, with the whole reunification process, jerking around the South while the South just kind of reacts it's interesting. Anyway, I think that's enough. Um, that's good. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. Pretty brutal, man. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Goodness. Okay. We want to end it there. Yeah, I guess. All right, little history lesson right. coming to an end. Hope it wasn't too bleak. Hope it was interesting enough. But, uh, oh well, it needed to be done. Anyway. This has been February, ooh, it's February 7th, <laughs> Tuesday, 2023. Past midnight, new day. Past midnight in Yeju, within range of North Korean artillery in South Korea. All right. All right, good night. Bye.